So two and a half years ago, I was sitting where you all are sitting out in the audience today. We were still in the middle of the hiring process, so I had to come incognito as an audience member to try to figure out what this hub thing was all about. And, and what I experienced here was a, just an enormous amount of energy, an enormous amount of, of cross-fertilization across sectors that really sealed the deal for me. So I, if I can find my clicker, here we go. So I just want to thank you all. We're not clicking. All right, we're clicking. So I want to thank you all for convincing me that this was the right place to be, a place uh, with, with, that breeds cross-sector fertilization, that builds bridges between industry, academia, government, and nonprofits to try to create big data solutions to big challenges. And that's us, the red dot right there. By the way, I thought that sunshine was a myth until we got into this room on a sunny day. So thank you to the journalism school for this room. Um, so these are the, the nine areas that are a priority area. So over the last couple of years, we've managed to get projects up and running in four of these priority areas. And we have projects in the works in, in three other uh, areas. So as Kathy mentioned, uh, three of the projects are spoke projects, which is the annual call for proposals from the National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, she, she already told you about them. You're going to be hearing updates on them later on in the day uh, with the lightning talks. We also had four planning projects, one of which was in energy, two in, in, uh, in privacy and security, uh, and one in data literacy. And you'll notice in the agenda that today one of the breakout sessions is going to be in data literacy. Um, so this is an ongoing activity and, and we're moving the ball along there to try to get to some concrete projects in that space as well. We also launched an innovator internship series which is very successful. Uh, we placed four, uh, sorry, eight students in, in uh, different organizations and the idea there was to try to support organizations that don't have the wherewithal to actually pay for internships. So we placed them in nonprofit organizations, we placed them in startup companies like Text IQ, which is a text mining startup. Um, and, and it was a great program that we're, we're now trying to find ways of, of uh, continuing the funding for and expanding. And finally, we launched uh, the Big Data Map and the Cybersecurity Risk Initiative. So those two are new initiatives that we just got funding for at the end of last year, and we just launched this year. Um, so the Big Data Map, uh, the, the genesis of that, uh, it starts uh, way back when I first started at the Hub, and I was going around speaking to folks about what their needs were, trying to understand the cross sectors, uh, what we might be able to do to add value. So one thing that became pretty clear is that regardless of who we were speaking to, there was a big gap in understanding what resources were available from a, from a data sciences perspective um, and, and you know, across sectors, across verticals, et cetera. Uh, obviously, it depended on who you spoke to, but clearly there was a, a, a challenge there. Uh, in discussions with the other hubs executive directors, of which we have uh, Meredith Lee is here from the West Hub and Leah Shanley is here from the South. Uh, others, I think, are joining on the live stream. Um, it became clear that this was a challenge across the different hubs. So we got together and decided that uh, we might be able to do something about it, at least make a dent in the problem, uh, by creating what we're calling a big data map. And the idea there is to try to map out hardware, software, data sets, people, etc. cetera. Uh, we decided to divide and conquer uh, to try to take best advantage of our resources. Uh, so the West Hub uh, is taking on the people piece, trying to map out where the data science talent is. Uh, the South Hub has brought together the different infrastructure work groups that were getting together in each of the hubs to talk about the software and the hardware resources that were available. And they've been leading the charge in, in bringing this cross-hub uh, group of folks together to talk about um, what's available to, to, to folks who, who need data science resources. And we decided to take the data piece. Um, in the early discussions uh, about how we would do this, and, and I was uh, fortunate to, to start speaking with Andy Mueller, who's a machine learning researcher here at the Data Science Institute, and we said, you know, we have limited resources to get this project up and running. How do we want to use these resources? We decided that we didn't want to just collect data for the sake of collecting data. We wanted to collect data that was useful. Um, so we turned the, the idea on its head and said, rather than collecting data, why don't we collect use cases, challenges, the tasks that people are trying to solve using data, and then have them bring along associated data sets if they have them, or maybe we can help them if they don't have to, to identify data sets that would be useful in this space. We also said, again, because we're, we're trying to do this uh, in, in a bootstrap method, 
Um, maybe we can use the community to do a lot of what we would like to do to make this data useful. Um, so the idea uh, evolved into trying to figure out uh, whether we can get the community to A, tag the data, so rather than creating dense metadata schemas, which are very useful but also time consuming, um, we said, what if we let the community tell us what it is that they want to know about the data to decide whether they want to explore it, and also have the community uh, help us to create solutions for some of the challenges that are posted, and on the other hand, uh, have the community rank the data sets and rank the solutions as well. Um, so this is, this is our grand experiment uh, on the data side to figure out if we can map data sets that are based on use. We decided to focus on three specific areas to start off, transportation, uh, public health, and cybersecurity. Um, and we were fortunate that Andy uh, is helping us to take the lead on developing the platform. Uh, we've hired a student to work with him, uh, and we're in the process of recruiting other students who will be subject matter experts in each of those areas, so transportation, public health, and cybersecurity. And the idea there is that they go out into the community try to understand uh, patterns of challenges that we might be able to address. Um, and they, they help engage that community to actually post those challenges. So, so the hope is if we can build enough critical mass here, uh, maybe eventually we can work into a situation in which people post challenges and we can already tell them which data sets might be useful uh, to help solve those challenges or which solutions might be useful. The, the next project here, Cybersecurity Risk, uh, the idea there developed in conversations that I had with folks in the insurance industry. As, as you can imagine, in today's world, everybody wants cybersecurity liability insurance. Uh, the challenge there is that the carriers don't really understand cybersecurity risk well enough to be able to underwrite the, the, these policies effectively. So this becomes a real challenge from not, not only for the insurance industry, but a large economic challenge as well. And, and beyond that, as you can imagine, it's a challenge for anybody who needs to defend their ecosystem and understand their cybersecurity risks. So it became the type of problem um, that we're really uh, set up to, to try to address, large challenge that requires multi-sector solutions. Um, so, uh, it, and also applicable to anybody, not just the insurance industry. So we said, well, maybe we can, uh, again, try to help address this problem a little bit. Um, and maybe, maybe the hub, uh, the Northeast hub, and, and beyond that collectively across the hubs, we might be able to at least create the conditions to help understand cybersecurity risk better. Uh, so we got a, a bit of funding from the NSF to pull together a couple of workshops to bring together stakeholders across sectors in that, in that domain to try to understand the scope of the challenge and figure out if there are low-hanging fruits that the hubs may be able to help uh, in the next three or four years to create conditions to better understand cybersecurity risk. Uh, we've managed to, to pull together a great organizing committee, which includes the, the chief data scientist for McAfee, uh, the data science team at Aon, which I think is the largest insurance broker. Uh, there are folks from across academic institutions, um, from Columbia, from Rutgers, from NYU's Courant Institute, the, the risk economics group there. Um, so we have folks on the policy side, on the cybersecurity side, on the business side, et cetera. And we're just getting started in trying to pull together that first workshop and deciding uh, which direction we're going to take initially there. Uh, the, the last two here are, are the in the works uh, part of this. <coughs> Excuse me. So the idea there is, uh, as I mentioned, data literacy is one of the breakout sessions. And we're starting to look at uh, what I was told recently I should be calling the, uh, the, not the talent pipeline, but the talent watershed. So we're trying to look across that talent watershed because clearly not only is there, is there a challenge in trying to, to develop uh, the folks from the academic side with, with the technical skills, uh, but there's also a challenge in, in the folks who are the decision makers who need to understand how to think about data sciences and how to use it effectively depending on what their domain is. So we're exploring across that spectrum to see what we might be able to do there. Uh, and then the, the final one is uh, data ethics. We were fortunate uh, that Natalie Evans-Harris, who, who I think is somewhere in the room today, agreed to help uh, lead that breakout session for us. She's been engaged in, in uh, initiatives with uh, Bloomberg, with Data for Democracy, et cetera, and trying to create a framework for data ethics. Um, so we're looking forward to those two breakout sessions later today. Um, so in addition to these specific projects, we've done a lot of outreach in a lot of different ways. So one is events. In the last two and a half years, uh, we've, we've either convened or participated in, in over 40 events, uh, which represent somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000 people, live people. Um, 
as opposed to virtual people. We've also redone our, our uh, website and our online presence, thanks to, to uh, Katie, Katie Nam. She redid our entire digital presence. Uh, so we have a great new website. We started a newsletter. We're much more active on Twitter. We, we're at the beginnings of starting a, a blog series. And the end result of that is, um, while, while we're not Google, Corinna, but we do have 9,000 unique visitors a month. Uh, so for us, that's big news. Um, and, and altogether, we're reaching tens of thousands of people. So I think we're, we're really starting to get out into the community and, and at least socialize the idea of the hubs and, and what we represent and what we might be able to do for the community and also learn from that community uh, what we can do for you. Um, I, I pasted this piece of our website up there mostly to remind me um, that we needed to talk about the call for workshop proposals. Um, so we have a bit of funding that's available for matching grants and the idea here is for planning workshops for projects in any one of the areas uh, that are our priority areas that I posted a little bit earlier. In addition to that, our, our partner Microsoft, who's been a great partner to the hubs, uh, has also agreed to provide uh, cloud computing credits, up to $25,000 of cloud computing credits. So we issued an RFP. Anybody who's interested, please go to the website and check out the RFP and apply for it. Uh, we'd love to, to get you together to create uh, new project ideas that, that fit into those priority areas. Um, so in addition to this kind of mass outreach, I've also been doing a lot more one-on-one -on -one outreach. So, so this is part of our, of our big data road trip. Um, we've hit 10 cities so far in the Northeast. Uh, from, from, thanks Katie for this, from Pittsburgh to Portsmouth, it rolls off the tongue. Um, so in addition to that, we've, uh, we've been to 10 cities uh, across the U.S. And, and actually even internationally in Madrid and Barcelona. And I think, I think Santi is in the crowd who's our longest uh, traveler who came here from, from Madrid. So thanks, Santi. Um, and the idea here is to really get out into the community to discover stakeholder needs, uh, to try to identify the, the data resources that might be available. Uh, and also, you know, we're charged not only with our mission, but also with becoming a self-sustaining organization. So we're looking at different ways of interacting with our members, not only that are effective in, in the sense of that, that interaction, uh, but also that leads to, to a more sustainable hub uh, beyond the NSF funding. So we're looking at uh, different membership models, different consortia models. Are there uh, partnership and collaboration opportunities that, that we still need to explore? And along those lines, we just uh, launched a social network analysis of the hub, uh, which the New York Hall of Science and Alan Daly, who's a researcher at UCSD, are, are leading for us. And the idea there is to really try to understand the hub network, understand the strength of the relationship between nodes, between organizations and individuals, uh, figure out where the strengths are that we can double down on and where the weaknesses are that we need to shore up, and feed that into uh, creating a strategic model for the hub. Uh, we also received some funding to bring on board a couple of business analysts, which just started working with us uh, a few weeks ago. And, and we're going out there and trying to understand how we map the stakeholder needs to the, the assets that we have in the hub to create a strategic model for the next round. So the output of all of this, and, and I apologize, I, I didn't have time to get new logos for this, so these are the slides from uh, last year. But just to give you a sense, um, there are a lot of companies that we're engaged with, and, and this ranges from partnerships to uh, collaborations on our projects to ongoing discussions that we have. Um, there are a lot of universities in here. Uh, I did update New Hampshire, Bob McGrath, for you. So New University of New Hampshire is up there. Um, but and this is not a comprehensive list, but you'll recognize a lot of the institutions here. Um, a lot of uh, agencies from the federal level down to the local level. And, uh, and we're starting to make a dent in the nonprofit world as well. We are also engaged, uh, all of the hubs, in, in ongoing coordination between the hubs. So while we're regionally focused, we also recognize pretty early on that there's a lot of value in coordinating on a national scale when we can. Um, so this is the latest example of the types of things that we've been doing together. This was spearheaded by, by Meredith in the, in the West Hub. Uh, and this is a collaboration with the Department of Transportation and others that you see here. And the idea here was focused on Vision Zero. So this was a six-month sprint that included hackathons, it included roundtables, it included demo sessions, et cetera. And it represents a collaboration between the four hubs and, and all of the institutions that you see here, um, everybody from Esri to NREL to, to all of the cloud providers. And, and finally, I, I, I always say this in all of our presentations, what I've, what I've learned, 
Oops, there we go. So what I've learned um, through all of these interactions with all of these people across all of these sectors and all of these cities is, is really that it's not just about the technology. Um, some of the challenges, the biggest challenges, are actually not technological challenges, they're people challenges. Um, we need to remember that by and large, I guess unless it's a B2B technology, we're developing technology for people. And in addition to that, I think it's important to, to remember that people are using these technologies and they can decide to use them for good and, and for not so good as we've been hearing about recently, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally. So I think it's appropriate that we're sitting in the Pulitzer Hall of the, of the beautiful Columbia Journalism School, and, and this is in fact the home of the Pulitzer Prizes. So coincidentally, last year one of the prizes went to the New York Times staff for their Russia Dark Arts series. So you can probably guess what that's about. It had really two components. So the first component was focusing on the trolls that are spreading uh, fake news and misinformation. And the other piece of it was focused on, on the Russian hacking of the US elections. So today, serendipitously, um, we're going to follow this up with conversations about fake news, about the impact of digital media across sectors. And we're going to round it off with trying to figure out how we create the conditions for data ethics to be an instinct rather than an afterthought. So I want to thank you all for joining us. We had fortunately a wonderful day for, for us all to be here with a lot of windows now in our new venue. So I'm really excited about hearing the talks, participating in the breakouts, and really learning from all of you. So thank you very much.